Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Blaine Ruschak, president of the PhD Project, and thank you for joining us to talk about advancing DEI in the 21st century America. Tonight, our discussion is going to be talking about some very challenging times, and I will bold and emphasize challenging. While progress is being made, many have questioned the validity of DEI and have taken strides to remove DEI efforts from classrooms to boardrooms. This leaves us with the question, is there a future for DEI in 21st century America? How can we advance DEI and work around these obstacles? Now, as someone who leads an organization that is fully focused on DEI, I'm sure hoping the answer is yes. I'm looking forward to today's great discussion. So before we move into the formal agenda, just wanted to share a little bit about the PhD project. The project was founded almost 30 years ago, before DEI was even a buzzword, to try and address the significant lack of diversity in business and more specifically business schools. Four innovative organizations, the KPMG Foundation, Citigroup, DMAC, and AACSB embarked on a journey to test the premise that if you can change the front of the classroom by increasing diversity at the professor level, it would lead to a change in the diversity in the class, which would lead to a change in diversity of business professionals, which would ultimately lead to a change in the diversity of C-suite executives and boardrooms. The hypothesis has proven to be true, and we coined this phenomenon as the role model effect. This continues to be our passion and our mission, to build a stronger, more diverse workforce together with our many university and corporate partners. Since its founding, the PhD project has helped quintuple the number of Black, African American, Latinx, Hispanic American, and Native American business PhDs in the country. And we are just 16 new PhDs away from announcing Dr. Shays and reaching the sextupling milestone, which is pretty amazing for our organization um, and our contribution to trying to change diversity in academia as well as in business. So if you want to learn more about how you can get involved, either as potentially a future PhD student and faculty member as part of the project, or a university sponsor, or a corporate or other organization sponsor, then please just go to our website, phdproject.org, to learn more, or reach out to our development director, Ms. Marie Zara, who's on the webinar today, and I think she'll put her contact information into the chat. So now, on to today's exciting program. I talked about our members. Our members are making a huge impact on students at colleges and universities across the country. I'm really excited to introduce today's panelists. Okay. Two of our panelists are from member are our members, and that is Dr. Veronica Caridad Cruz Robello, Associate Professor of Management at San Francisco State University. And we have Dr. Jerome Stewart, Assistant Professor of Management at College of Charleston. They're both PhD project members and tremendous examples of those who are inspiring the next generation of business professionals and helping to advance DEI during these challenging times. And we are extremely thrilled to welcome Melody Gonzalez, Executive Director of the White House Initiative on Advancing Educational Equity, Excellence, and Economic Opportunity for Hispanics. I am sure that does not fit on the old standard business card. That is <laughs> quite, a, quite an impressive title. Um, welcome, Melody. So the PhD project has been a proud um, partner of this White House Initiative since 2015, when the project was chosen as a bright spot in Hispanic education for their work to empower faculty to provide mentorship opportunities and support to Hispanic college students. We look forward to this continued collaboration with this critical initiative. And now I will turn it over to our fantastic moderator, Sasha Thompson, founder of the Equity Equation, who's going to lead our discussion today on advancing DEI in 21st century America. Take it away, Sasha. Thank you so much, Blaine. I am so excited to be with you all this evening and moderating this amazing panel, just preparing for it. I, I've just been so excited. So you know, Blaine did such a wonderful job with the introductions, so no need to do that again. But what we will do is we'll just dive right into this discussion. Um, I do want to let everyone know that if you have comments, questions, please feel free to use the chat feature. We will try to incorporate those questions um, as a part of the conversation if we can. Uh, there were also some that were sent in ahead of time. And so again, we will try to accommodate those as the conversation goes on. So as we dive in, so let's just set the stage. 
So we are at an interesting place in American history. We are three years post-racial unrest following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. And organizations from academia to the Fortune 50 made pledges supporting racial equity and increasing resources for diversity, equity, and inclusion. But we're now seeing a swing of the pendulum in the other direction. Affirmative action and race-based admissions are now in the front, now in front of the Supreme Court. And with the recent overturn of Roe v. Wade, many are not optimistic about the outcomes. So in academia, we're seeing a call at the state level to dismantle DEI, to dismantle diversity, equity, and inclusion. So Jerome, I want to start with you. You live in a state currently um, where this is being impacted. How can these, how is this really affecting some of these college campuses? I do live in a place um, that is a fact. I live in South Carolina. Thank you so much, Sasha. It's so great to be here. This is really exciting. Um, so actually, I didn't know this was as big of a deal. I think I was pretty naive. So I came down to South Carolina from the Bay Area. And um, of all the things that surprised me, I would say that the momentum of this anti-DEI work, the, the um, anti-CRT work as well, that really did surprise me because it's really real. So in South Carolina here, I think there was a bill introduced just last week that pretty much mirrors what has happened in Florida, what has happened elsewhere. So just as a quick review for people. So that bill here in South Carolina um, that mirrors some of the other ones, it mandates that schools, that universities report uh, DEI related positions like a, like a DNI officer, chief inclusion officer uh, to the state in some capacity. It would, it would prohibit preference to historically marginalized students for admissions, for employment, for promotion. It would prohibit mandatory DEI training. It would prohibit also asking um, for diversity statements for job applicants. And, and many of you saw what is happening in UNC Charlotte, or sorry, UNC Chapel Hill with regard to that. Um, and then there's, I think part of this legislation is also mandating that as faculty, we would report any DEI related course material to the state in some capacity as well. Uh, that's all really terrifying to me. And it's really overwhelming to be honest with you all. Uh, so I think in the immediate term, what really affects me the most about it is that I'm really just kind of more buttoned up when I do teach. I teach a class called organizational diversity. Uh, my, my organizational strategy class is, is really steeped in, in d as well. And so I really cross my T's, dot my I's in ways that um, I didn't think about before I came here. I, I can't afford to half step because, you know, we, we've heard the horror stories. So you don't know who's waiting on you to, to kind of say something um, that they can latch on to. Um, so maybe a last, you know, to that point, a last point there is that um, it's made it really clear to me, if it wasn't clear before, we as educators, particularly here in the South, we have to sort of create that type of classroom that cultivates a two-way sense of trust uh, between students and faculty. And so one tool I use to do that um, has been the Brave Space Framing. It's, a, it's an imperfect framing. It's, um, you know, if you look that up, the Brave Space versus the Safe Space, it's not a not a perfect tool, but it's something that has really helped me pretty successfully to get students to reduce that defensiveness that I think is what often drives the backlash in classes to DNI content. Um, and they're much more vulnerable and kind of open to me and, and willing to, to really engage me in these things uh, in, in constructive ways. Uh, okay, and then the last point I was thinking about, um, broader than my position, it affects the College of Charleston where I'm currently at in really significant ways that I would never have thought about um, and I really appreciate some of the work they're doing within the School of Business. You know, uh, we've got a new dean, Dean Paul Schwager, um, and I would sort of decline to even say much more about what a School of Business is even doing down here in the South um, in support of DEI, because I don't really want to bring them much attention. Uh, and I mean, so that's, I tell you that just as a, as a nod to how difficult I think it is down here. So, you know, I would, um, being that I'm moving to University of, of San Francisco in the fall, I'd really be curious to hear from my, my great colleague, Veronica, a bit about how her experience differs um, you know, from mine. I suspect that's where we might go. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jerome. And you know, something that you said that really stuck with me was just the navigation of this, right? It's the content still very relevant, but you know, how you have to kind of jump through hoops as an educator, um, is concerning, it's concerning. So thank you for sharing that. 
And absolutely, Veronica, you know, you are in California, you are in a state that um, is not going through, you know, much of this right now. And so talk to me about how um, this impacts a state that is currently not impacted. Yeah, so we also have had some legislative shifts regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion related curriculum. Um, for example, Assembly Bill 101 created a mandated uh, semester long ethnic studies course uh, for all high school graduates. So um, everyone needs to take at least one semester of ethnic studies as part of high school graduation requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some concerns. Um, it's not exactly clear what kind of resources the state is offering to train teachers to um, be able to teach this class. Um, and there are differences in the classroom, say, when diversity, equity, inclusion related content is mandatory for, versus optional. And we see similar parallels right in the corporate world. I'm sure a lot of you have experience with that when a um, DEI related training is mandated for everyone versus more self selection. Um, but more generally, I think something I've noticed in states that maybe don't have this more reactionary um, legislation or legislative proposals around critical race theory, DEI, et cetera, is um, a false state of complacency. That's something that concerns me. And self righteousness at the expense of solidarity. And so I've seen that take a few forms. I think some faculty say, oh, because we live in the San Francisco Bay Area, we don't have to talk about any of these issues in our classes. Like people are just gonna, you know, magically soak it up on their own in their free time. Um, and I sometimes worry that this like moral superiority complex by comparing ourselves to other states or other regions can lead us to overlook really major problems in our own backyard. Like San Francisco Bay Area, I think has some of the most palpable inequality where on the one hand, there's so much wealth concentration with the tech industry and a huge houseless population as a direct result of you know, this rampant um, growth and gentrification, et cetera. Um, so yeah, that's where I'll pause. I think even if we might not have overt legislative backlash, um, that certainly doesn't mean we don't have our fair share of problems here too. No, thank you for that. And, you know, again, pointing out this idea that, oh, because we have the freedom to speak about these things, we don't need to speak about these things can lead to even more harm, right? More challenges. So when something does come up, at least what I've experienced is people are like, oh, we've never experienced this before, <laughs> right? We don't know what to do. So, you know, it's definitely a need to, to have those conversations. So, you know, on the other hand, there's been so much progress on the equity front from the federal government, right? Melody, can you please share what your office has been seeing in terms of progress around educational equity that might be helpful for higher education leaders to know? Absolutely. Thanks, Sasha. And thanks to the PhD project for bringing us together. I, I first heard of the PhD project a few years ago when I was doing a Latina leadership program and heard about it from my friend Marisa Herrera, who encouraged one of my other friends, who I think is on the chat with us, Martha Troncoso, to look into it. And Martha, now these years later, is finishing up her PhD, getting out into the job market. So have seen firsthand the power of the PhD network and work. And I'm really glad that we're here in conversation on this really important topic. For me, I, I never imagined I'd serve in a presidential administration. I grew up in Chula Vista, California, uh, Mexicana, uh, and there on just on the U.S. side of the Mexican border, we didn't even know to dream dreams like these sort of career opportunities that have been here. And so I think there are a number of us serving in President Biden's administration who come from corners of this country where we are on a mission to make sure students and community members know that there's a place for them in government. There are people that not only look like them, but carry shared stories, shared values that are working on the inside to advance equity. Mm -hmm. And you know, what for me, what's really exciting is that a lot of the work that's happening is not business as usual in government right now. We're moving equity in really historic and interesting ways. Um, since one, President Biden has issued a number of executive orders and presidential memoranda that are really compelling all of the agencies to move on equity in a whole new level. 
we have the most diverse cabinet in history. My office, the White House Initiative on Advancing Educational Equity, Economic Opportunity, and Excellence for Hispanics is housed at the U.S. Department of Education. And we are headed by Secretary Miguel Cardona here at the Department of Ed, somebody who is an educator, but also father, Latino, rose up the ranks to, from the classroom to then become state superintendent, navigating through the COVID-19 pandemic and then getting called into service here. And so what I love about this atmosphere is that from the top down, there are a number of leaders who really are on a mission to use this moment to do good. Um, we all know that equity issues existed even before the pandemic, but now that historic federal resources are getting deployed, we're on a mission to make sure that those federal dollars are being leveraged to the maximum potential, that leaders like you all, students, educators, family members, parents, everybody knows that they have a voice to advocate for their money, for their power. Um, and so there's some really interesting things that are happening on the equity front, like for the first time ever, all of the federal agencies have drafted and are now implementing equity plans. That's never happened before. And you can see summaries of them at whitehouse.gov slash equity. Um, among the presidential appointees, I'm part of a great community of Lati Latino and Latina presidential appointees, but there are also many diverse others, including you know, 30 32% of our appointee community are naturalized citizens or the children of immigrants. Um, very diverse in a number of different ways, but always still pressing forward to have more on the workforce diversity front. But also what's really interesting is that we're moving on policy and money and civil rights and all of these other sort of practices to do better. Um, for example, for the first time, all of the agencies are hiring or positioning people to be chief diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility officers. That's never happened in the history of this country. And they're not just you know, holding those names superficially, they're really taking the work into heart. Um, and the changes around equity, they're having to report to the White House, to the White House Office of Management and Budget around what they're doing, what shifts they're making to increase access through policy, through programs, through grants and funding, through their own diversity of their agency's workforce, um, through their agency's civil rights work, and also through procurement. You know, as a Latina, one of the things that's been really striking to me is that historically Latinos have only been 10, less than 10% of all federal employees. Um, Hispanic owned businesses have traditionally gotten less than 2% of all federal contracts. And so it's really interesting to pull back all of the layers and be working with all of the federal agencies to figure how we do better on these systemic fronts. And within Ed in particular, I've been really, you know, just amazed by, by my coworkers here. Um, you know, our office is different than it has been in the past. Our, we now have equity and economic opportunity into our work. We are also part of a community of sister, what we call our sister White House initiatives. So in addition to our Hispanic initiative, we have White House initiatives for the HBCU community, for Black Americans, for the Native Americans, tribal colleges, for uh, the, uh, the Wianpi community, our Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders communities. And for the first time ever, all of us that are executive directors for these White House initiatives, we're all women. And that's never happened before. And so it's really great to be in community and literally a sisterhood there with our sister initiatives where all of us are working across government with different agencies to move equity. And with Secretary Cardona, he's really bringing his experience, you know, through the, what we're called the raise the bar, lead the world vision. And so he's really focused on working with our agency and partners like you all to make sure we're helping, you know, boldly advance academic outcomes for our students. You know, one of the things he's really big on is saying, we can't keep the bar low and say, oh, our poor children, this and that. He calls it the ay bendito effect. He's like, you can't just say like, oh, they're behaving well, like not challenge them, let them be. No, he's like, we've got to set expectations hard. We've got to deliver quality education to every child and make sure that they're excelling. We've got to boldly improve learning outcomes. And part of that also requires us to pay teachers and make sure that we are, you know, addressing the teacher shortage and explicitly diversifying our teaching profession. And he's always really focused as well on creating pathways for global engagement, which means building a more multilingual America. And a lot of what he talks about is, and is also putting policy and money behind, is the fact that, you know, for example, people that learn uh, or come in as native speakers of a language other than English shouldn't be forced to lose it. And then come high school, be forced to take those classes or step into those classes and try to get AP or IB credit. And then if you get to college, pay college tuition to try to get those language skills back in. It's like every student in America should be multilingual to be able to excel and thrive in this multilingual you know, global economy. And what's really energizing to see is that this is all more than just talk. There's money behind a lot of this. You know, so we've put funds, historic funds through the American Rescue Plan. 
And part of those funds that went to our states for educational purposes and academic recovery required that equity be integrated into the use of those funds. So if that's not happening in ways that you would hope to be seeing in your community, ask questions. How are those American Rescue Plans being used? If there are bright spots, we wanna hear those to make sure we're uplifting them. The Higher Education Emergency Relief Funds, or HERF, which many of you might have also been involved with, was really a lifeline to help students you know, stay in school and not drop out. Some 18 million students were able to stay in school through direct support as a result of those funds. Um, we've canceled more student loans than ever in history. That has a huge racial equity impact. Um, we're continuing to move. I know a, a friend, Diana Gaba, got $180,000 of her public service loans canceled through the PSLF program. And while we're waiting to see what happens in the Supreme Court, that move that the president and secretary Cardona announced to cancel 10 or $20,000 in student loans would also have really big equity impacts. And from our Latino community's perspective, that move would help cancel one in two Latino borrowers loans completely. And so, you know, we just announced, we can talk more earlier today, we did a whole Zoom webinar on the president's budget request and some of the moves that we're trying to make to make sure we're really investing in programs, whether it's increasing Pell grants, you know, pushing to continue for two years of free post-secondary education for community colleges. Um, there's new grant programs like the Hawkins Grant Program that's gonna help minority serving institutions strengthen the teacher diversity pipeline. Um, there's a lot of money and systemic change that's moving right now. So I think while things might be challenging in certain localities or regions of the country, I think one of my big messages is just, you aren't alone, there is a lot of support. And I also just wanna make a plug that within our Department of Education, we have a really fantastic office for civil rights. And I can share in the chat and as a follow-up, um, but just a few weeks ago, we had our Cesar Chavez Day Zoom where we uplifted federal staff working in support of migrant students and migrant families' rights. And you know, our staff that heads the Office of Civil Rights shared, we've got 400 staff members around the country who are taking complaints, investigating complaints. And so if things are rising to the point where there are real challenges in your communities, you know, know that our staff is here with you know, well-informed and armed lawyers and investigators to support you. And even before things get to the point of having to file complaints, we're putting a lot, a, a lot of guidance um, on our website for the Office of Civil Rights too in the newsroom. You can see a lot of the cases that are getting settled, yeah. whether it's around things that might have to do with anti-Semitic incidents happening on campuses or you know, injustices impacting you know, athletics and the gender a person might identify with. Um, and it, one of the things too, I'll also share in the chat is a fact sheet that they shared around diversity and inclusion activities that are permitted. And they were very clear in this fact sheet to confirm that as educators, students, parents, diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings and similar activities are generally consistent with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. And so some of these documents and resources may be really helpful for you all to take a look at and make sure that your community, your colleagues are aware of these resources should you need them. Thank you, Melody. Thank you so much. So I want to talk about, because we've talked about, you know, education and academia for a while, um, but these issues, as been touched on by, you know, all of you in some way, also impact the business world, right? You are educating, you know, the future scholars, the future business leaders of, of the world. And so, Veronica, I want to talk to you um, and Jerome, a little bit about how is what you're seeing taking shape influencing business from your perspective? So, Veronica, we'll start with you. Yeah, um, it's easier for me to think of an answer to this question in a more individual sense than a macro sense. By that, I mean, um, I think depending on personality or capacity, like leaders will really vary in their ability to be engaged in academic literature and research, which is frankly not very accessible to people outside of academia. So um, yeah, there's, I think, a lot of missed opportunities, both between the ways a lot of um, organizations don't value learning in terms of giving all employees in an organization time and capacity to um, learn and deepen their skill set and retrain. Um, and then on the flip side in academia, there's not a lot of value placed on making our work um, accessible and applicable, which I realize sounds counterintuitive. And yet that's just the nature of 
a lot of people's job design. So in my experience, at least, it then becomes a little more idiosyncratic in terms of which academics are able to, you know, proliferate uh, their work more widely, um, either as a value or, you know, capacity they have. And on the flip side, which organizations um, value that kind of engagement. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that because um, I believe it was Lean In. I'm trying to remember which, it was either Lean In or HBR. I'm trying to remember which one. Recently did a survey where they realized that now that we're in this post-pandemic world, one of the things that a lot of employees are looking for is psychological safety. So, but when you think about psychological safety, one of the elements of that is learner safety. Right, so exactly what you're talking about, having the ability to learn, having the ability to connect with other people and also share that knowledge. So, you know, there's this natural bridge that I see, and I think it's because I come from <laughs> academia in a way, you know, to business, there is a way for what's happening now to really impact um, what organizations are doing in a way that is academically like research based versus, oh, this is what I feel like doing, right? So we, we definitely need to have that. Um, Jerome, what are you thinking about when you hear what's happening now and the impact of business, particularly you know, as you're working with future leaders? Yes, um, I really liked Veronica's point about the inaccessibility of, of our you know, particularly our, our like research that we publish. Um, so you know, I'll, I'll save that point. I think it's really hard to know, uh, but maybe I can draw a little bit on some anecdotal experience. I'll try to be positive. I'll, I'll only I'll do a positive. I'm gonna do a po- yeah. Oh, Veronica's face, everybody. <laughs> yeah, um, me being positive. Okay, so I'm unsure how my anecdotal experience kind of generalizes to future leaders, but take this with a grain of salt. But um, so I teach a largely white student population that ranges from fairly liberal in the ways that popular discourse might identify liberal, maybe not to me, but um, to fairly conservative. Uh, and I teach this population classes, like I mentioned earlier, organ, uh, classes such as organizational diversity. I am more confident now in 2023 in my, you know, I've, I've been doing this about a decade. I'm more confident now than I've ever been that we are actually giving these, you know, future leaders to the extent that I'm teaching future leaders, um, that we are giving them really good DNI material. Hmm. I was really skeptical on this in graduate school, and I, I'm really critical of most of the academic, in particular, the, the um, business literature on DNI is generally really, really bad. And so I think today we are giving them um, some of the best information we've ever given them. And in my classes, even these conservative students, they're, they're not, um, often we're kind of led to believe that we pay too much attention to the popular um, notions of these really unreasonable conservatives that are just sitting in the back of our classes waiting to, you know, catch us on something and, and say some really inflammatory things. But generally, students aren't like that. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're really very interested in learning about things such as discrimination in the hiring process, um, housing as a human right versus housing as a market commodity, uh, the prevalence of prevalence of wage theft, maybe by by employers, they're really fascinated by these things, and they really want to read the data that I show them and and read about um, how this happens in real life. And we're not on the same page in how they interpret this information, surely. But I give them the space to try to understand this data. Um, and at the end of class, I think these students, again, these conservative students, end up conveying far more reasonable understandings of DNI. That I think we're led to believe. And so I, I don't know what this means for potential future leaders, but I'm pretty confident that, that the students that I'm teaching, the ones that I'm seeing, um, are not participating or sort of blindly buying into these unreasonable and incredibly insecure anti-DNI movements um, in the in the you know more right-wing circles. I, I don't think that's that's generally what we're seeing. And I think we're um we're producing a, a far more reasonable students who, whose knowledge is, is steeped in a lot of the academic work. Um, and then as a last point, um, I don't know, it, maybe, I don't know if that's necessarily, but, you know, my, um, 
one of the thoughts about future leaders, I just thought of this now as Veronica was talking about future leaders. I think a lot of the, the future leaders of DNI are coming from academia. Uh, I know there are some people listening and watching us right now who are now working in the corporate DNI space who came from academia. Um, and I and I really think they're doing a, a great job at moving the conversation uh, in DNI away from the sort of regressive business case modules to something more aligned with the moral imperative. And I think we might talk about that later, uh, or at least maybe I will. Um, so I'll stop there. No, Jerome, you just made my heart sing because <laughs> I um, I actually have been interviewing DEI practitioners and coaches the last couple of weeks. And of seven people that I've talked to, five come from higher education, right? So it speaks to exactly what you're talking about. And it's not having that HR background per se, but understanding how to facilitate conversations, how to engage in what you just described in your classroom is critical thinking, right? Let's give you the information and let's have a conversation around how we think about this critically. Um, you know, and again, being able to navigate what otherness looks like in different ways. So I appreciate, you know, you, you sharing that. Um, Melody, I want to tap on to what Jerome said a little bit about the data, right? Data is king, especially in corporate spaces, you know, what gets measured gets the money. And we know that. So what are some metrics that can be recommended? Um, what are some metrics that you can recommend that government agencies look for to measure progress? Yeah, I mean, I think what's really exciting is that we are we have at the White House, for example, the first ever racial equity data team uh, who've been mulling over a lot of these you know, questions themselves. There's so much data and information that's gathered by agencies or that agencies themselves have to report, but it's in many disparate different sort of places. And so what's really exciting is that there are a lot of us inside who are, you know, putting out different data calls from my office's perspective, my executive order gives us our office the authority to ask every agency to turn an action plan into us, sharing what their accomplishments are for the Latino community, and then also reflecting, you know, what are the improvements that need to be done on a number of different measures. And so, you know, some of this work is quantitative, right? Like how are you, how is diversity in your workforce reflected now in comparison to prior years, of course, but also even deeper, you know, where are, where is the diversity by GS pay grade level? You know, what sort of roles are diverse candidates working in? What is the representation like of diverse candidates in the senior executive ranks? And what's being done to hold executives accountable for being stronger DEI leaders, but also increasing the diversity there in that population. I think a really great example that I'm really enjoying working on is on the federal procurement piece. So the Small Business Administration for the first time ever disaggregated and put out into the public what the federal contracting diversity numbers look like. That's how I know less than 2% of, his, of everybody getting federal contracts are Hispanic owned businesses. So now that we know the numbers, we can start diving deeper to figure out, okay, where could we maybe do some pilot projects and deeper dive collaborations with different diverse organizations to get some more diverse contractors up into the system, figure out what are the barriers that they're facing. And I think, you know, the as we're working on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, part of it is about the data, right? The data can inform us about what the challenges are, but there's also that really important qualitative element, right? And so in that example of federal procurement, if we want to improve the numbers, you know, President Biden has issued a memo calling on agencies to do so. We have to work with all, every agency has an office of small and disadvantaged business utilization. So we have to work and have communications with those staff to figure out what's working, what are you trying, what's not working. We have to have conversations with our diverse potential contractors and figure out, okay, what's kept you from actually getting certified to apply for this process? If you've applied, what's kept you, what do you think has kept you in this process from actually securing and landing those grant dollars? Um, and so with that qualitative narrative, we're also then able to marry it up with the data to figure out what some potential solutions and new actions might be. Um, so those are just kind of a few of the different examples, but I think what's great is that we have a lot of different minds figuring out how do we better leverage data to inform our work? How are we engaging with the community in a really deep and meaningful way, including with our minority serving institutions and our diverse leaders who are predominantly white institutions to make sure that their views are helping inform policy and budget decisions. You know, and I would just really share with you all right now, we are in 
budget season in Washington, D.C. So the president issued his budget. Congress now has their turn to decide what they're going to do with our budget request. And you all as leaders can be advocating, sharing your views around what programs are important to you, what you want to see invested in more. And, you know, sometimes people wonder, like, does my voice matter? And I'll tell you, it does in so many ways. Sometimes when we're trying to make a, a case or an argument for something to get support, it might be about quantitative numbers. It might be about the data or the statistics, but oftentimes what's also really moving and sometimes even more moving to leaders who are in those decision-making seats are your stories of real impact. You know, and I think for me, as I, I do some of my DEIA work, some of it's internal, some of it's about policy or programs or civil rights, but I also really love the public engagement element of my job. And for me, what's really special is last year, we did uh, six White House Latino economic summits all around the country, all at Hispanic serving institutions. And we took the first lady and cabinet secretaries out on the road. We took about a dozen agencies out to do workshops. Um, three of our campuses that we visited were community colleges. We wanted to make sure to be not just in large cities, but also in some rural communities. And, um, you know, while we shared a lot of technical information, but some of my favorite moments are the stories that students shared. Like there was a young student in El Paso um, at UT El Paso when we did our event there who shared, you know, she was just so excited at the end of the event and I asked why. And she said, I've never heard and seen so many Latinos share about how our culture and our language can be professional assets, Absolutely. you know? And so while we're talking numbers and metrics and all of these technical things, I also feel like there's something really special about those human moments that we get to have with students and our young people where you can't quantify what sort of impact that moment might have in that student's life. And I'm excited to see what, what she's going to do moving forward. Wonderful. Like you, you've touched on three things that are so important to me, storytelling, right? Cause there's power in, in stories. Um, you mentioned accountability. That's like one of my buzzwords for 2023. <laughs> um, like what's the accountability in this and intentionality, right? Not just doing events or programs to check a box but what is the problem we're trying to solve and what are we doing? Like, what are those outcomes of whatever the program is that we're creating? So I appreciate that. Veronica, so I want to talk to you about, you know, how do we encourage these leaders? So, and again, an academic um, setting or in business to step into bravely, becoming brave, inclusive leaders, right? With so much that's happening right now, how do we encourage them to be brave in this, this in this time? I'll get my word down. Um, echoing Melody, I think storytelling and community are really important. I know that, you know, in the business world, it's very common to work in silos and to regard people in other organizations as adversaries or competition. And we can't be reinventing the wheel. The types of backlash and resistance we're going to encounter in one organization are going to look remarkably similar, if not identical to resistance and backlash in other organizations. So I think only by forming community and doing this work together across organizations can we have any hope of making progress, especially so we can learn about successes and failures at other organizations. Um, I think also working in community can help us understand this moment we're in that can so often feel um, like a really dramatic moment or crisis point is in some ways a form of new wine and old bottles. Like as a culture, as a society, we always go through these cycles of, um, you know, anti-intellectualism and populism in reaction to any kind of progress when it comes to racial equity or addressing other forms of um, historical injustice and their enduring legacy. And so at least for me, knowing this history, knowing this context is really helpful for situating the moment and being able to plug along. And I wanna shout out Dr. Laura Morgan Roberts. I'll drop a link to one of her um, <laughs> lectures where I just really appreciate how, yeah, she speaks to this similar theme and how by, remaining grounded in our history that can teach us a lot about strategy and present day. Um, and she's actually done one of these webinars with us. So amazing. Amazing. Her. Yeah. She's definitely one of my mentors. I learned so much from her. Um, yeah, I think also knowing this history, knowing this context can be really important to engage in 
myth busting because I think so much of the backlash against diversity, equity, inclusion is not grounded in fact. It's not grounded in what we would call reality. And so um, I think leaders especially can do a lot to role model and communicate to other members of the organization to address some of this resistance head on without also, you know, fueling the fire, because that's also what a lot of our detractors want to get a rise out of us and distract us from the progress inroads we are making. Um, the, I think last thing I will share is, I think it's important we also act with a sense of urgency and don't wait for the laws to change and tell us what to do. And to remember that we can play a huge role no matter where we are in the organizational hierarchy uh, in terms of changing practices, changing policies, both micro and macro without necessarily waiting for the law while also recognizing legislation is also something that cycles and can swing back and forth. So we obviously have to remain aware of it and you know, operate alongside those dynamics too. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I think is so important and you touched on just now is this work isn't the responsibility of one person, right? It's not just the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's everyone's responsibility. And so as you are doing this work and looking at how you could be more equitable, everyone has a role in that. Everyone can contribute. If you are a people manager or an individual contributor, you have a role that you can play in creating more equitable spaces. So I appreciate you um, adding that in there. So Melody, from your perspective too, you know, how can we encourage leaders to, to be brave in this time, particularly when um, everything seems to be tied to politics, to, you know, in some degree? Yeah, I mean, I love working for Secretary Miguel Cardona because he says we have to lead like we're running out of time He's always emphasizing the importance of, you know, working with urgency and says, you know, when, when the pandemic hit, it was a crisis and we all operated with urgency and we can't keep our foot off the gas pedal. We've got to keep organizing and keep mobilizing and keep working together because that's the way that we're going to come out stronger at the end of this. Um, you know, and I think about this issue kind of in a few ways. So I think on, on one hand, um, I'm grateful that I'm in a place where we are able to really be focused on inclusivity. Um, and I think about how, you know, a few of the things I'm seeing that work kind of systemically, right, is how important it is that we have that leadership from the top, right? So from the president, from our cabinet secretaries on down, there's that commitment, that emphasis to make sure that we are really leaning into equity in a, in a whole new different way. Um, you know, whether it's having the most diverse cabinet or the chief diversity officers that I've mentioned that are now at agencies, you know, those are kind of some things, but we're also creating a lot of different communities um, within government to try to be more inclusive. So in my office, for example, we ask that instead of agencies just designating a liaison to our office, we want them to stand up teams. And it's new and different, hasn't really been done this way before, but we specifically made a whole list of the types of staff that we want them to be thinking about bringing to, bringing to the table. You know, and of course, it's going to be senior executives and people that might traditionally be asked to join the interagency work group. But we said, you know, we also want you to consider people in your chief human capital office, your procurement and your grants offices, people that are not just working in D.C., but that are out across the country. I also talk a lot about making sure we're not just bringing in senior leaders, but that we're also bringing in junior and middle level staff mm -hmm. and giving. I'm really passionate about making sure that we have spaces for our our junior leaders, you know, and those that are newer and in the middle of their careers getting out and sharing their stories, sharing their work, because a lot of times they're able to connect with community in a whole other way that others might not be able to. So I think, you know, some of the things I think about are how can we kind of move the systems and kind of get the systems and people within those systems to think and behave differently. Um, but I've also been trained as an executive leadership coach, which has really gotten me in this practice of just reflecting a lot internally. And I think it comes back to us, you know, just as individuals doing some of that internal reflection. Um, and one of the themes that I, I learned about while I was getting trained came from Alexander Kayed, and it's a, a, a process called the thinking path that I think is really helpful, especially as we're thinking, working through equity work, which isn't often easy. Um, and so the, the kind of the narrative of the thinking path is the fact that, you know, if you're frustrated with the outcome that you're getting, take it back to what your originating thought is, because our thoughts impact our feelings, our feelings will then impact and help determine what behaviors we take. 
And then the behaviors in turn result in some sort of action. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling stuck or you're feeling like you're not getting ahead or you're really frustrated or whatever the case might be, I found it helpful to use that sort of model and break it down and say, okay, like, let me come back to the beginning. What new thought might I start off with? Right. And if I can reframe and try to come out with a different sort of originating thought, then I'm going to start generating different feelings. I might not be operating from a place of frustration or fear or anything that's kind of negative and draining. But once you start to have those more positive feelings, you might find that there are different behaviors or actions that you could take. Right. And that in turn can then lead to stronger outcomes. So I do think it comes back to, you know, a lot of mindset. Right. And thinking about, okay, if it feels like you're climbing uphill, a never ending hill or mountain, you know, take a moment to pause and ask yourself some questions. Like, what is it about this situation I'm in that's making me feel like this is so heavy? What yeah. might I do to lighten the load a little bit? You know, do I have to bear all of this work myself or how might I bring more people or coalitions in to help me and kind of spread, spread and lighten the load? How might I bring joy into this work if I'm feeling drained? How might I bring joy? Because work isn't, you know, it's not always that work-life balance where, you know, work is draining and personal life is what refills you. But it's like, we have to find moments of joy and energy in our work that we do day to day and in our personal lives. And when we find the joy, the healing, the unity, the connection, I think we're able to operate from a much stronger place and the systems that we're all having to navigate in. Thank you. That, you know, the coach in me is like, yes, change your mindset. I love it. Um, it's easier said than done. It's that's, much that's, easier, a, that's a little model. That, that's much, helpful. much easier said than done because <laughs> I have to coach myself all the time. So one of the questions that came into the chat um, that I actually, Jerome, I'm going to throw out to you. So I know we didn't prepare for this one, but, um, you know, a number of colleges are now Hispanic serving institutions. Are you finding that those institutions have a lot more innovation around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? What was the first part of the question about Hispanic serving institutions? Yeah, a number of colleges are now Hispanic serving yeah. institutions, Yeah. right? So are you finding that those institutions have a lot more innovation around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? Uh, well, I've only been at one and, uh, you know, I won't throw that university under the bus, but no, I don't, the short answer is no, I don't think they're any, in my experience, I don't think they're any more innovative than, than other, but not any less either. Yeah. And it's interesting because my gut reaction when I first saw that question went back to what Veronica said about sometimes folks feel we're, we're in it, we're good. So we don't have to think about it. And so there may be some complacency that happens. Um, but again, they may be excelling in, in other areas. So I think. And a lot of those, oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted oh, you. No, go for it. That was my, my mistake. Um, so a lot of the, the HSIs, HBCUs, you know, a lot of the efforts that we may be very vocal about right here at, at a predominantly white institution, like you're saying, we, those are more ingrained in the culture. So, you know, the, a lot of things we just, we don't really see, we don't, we might not talk about them nearly as much. Um, you know, there's not a, there's not a huge strategy to, to recruit um, diverse applicants to the school and re recruit diverse students because, right, like they're not full of white kids to begin with. Um, so I don't know that's about being any more innovative. Um, they just have a different set of challenges. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah, and I was sure, I think, you know, we have within our Department of Ed, there's an HSI division and there's the White House HBCU initiative and others that are working with tribal colleges and on APCs, et cetera. And I think that what I get to see kind of from the Washington DC perspective is that there are a lot of leaders in some of these different spaces, but sometimes as we're working on equity, those stories aren't always resonating and heard. Those examples aren't always heard and shared across the board. Um, so for those who are looking for some examples or models, you know, there's a few things that I might mention as, as sites to check out. So Excelencia in Education is a group that gives the seal, okay. awards the seal of Excelencia to HSIs that are not just serving, but actually demonstrating that they are helping create Hispanic thriving campuses. Mm -hmm. And so you can take a look at what those colleges have been reporting on that they're doing in terms of their practices to see if those sort of things are being done on your campuses or they might be able to be done at a greater to a greater extent on your campus. I think if you're interested and able to get out to some conferences, I always love going to the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities Conference, the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity, because you'll find that there are just so many dynamic 
you know, faculty members or staff or student support services leaders who really are doing some great support work and whose stories are shared in some of those spaces. Like another great conference I was just at was the National Association of Bilingual Educators, where they're doing a lot of really interesting workshops on, you know, leaders working at the local and state level to create change and great models to learn from and borrow from. Um, and then also within our Department of, of Education, we're sharing a number of different grants. I think there was a question earlier about how to learn more about the grants. And I'll plug our, our website is ed.gov slash Hispanic Initiative. And we'll be doing a blog post on the Zoom that we did today talking about grants. But one in particular is the Augustus F. Hawkins grant. And so that's an example where a number of the, the, that grant has never been funded in history before, but Congress finally did last year fund it. Those funds are for minority serving institutions to really develop stronger centers of excellence in terms of the teacher pipeline program. And so it's cool to see who got the funds from the first tranche, the first round of this grant program, and they share some of the things, types of things that they're trying to do on campus to advance equity, to build a more multilingual or diverse teaching profession. Um, so I, I always share that just to kind of say there are glimmers of hope and great examples out there, and we've got to keep uplifting those stories. And I know you all probably have bright spots as well. I'd love to learn more about the good work you all are doing so we can make sure we're sharing and learning from you as well. Wonderful, thank you. So as we wrap up, um, I'm trying to decide which question I want to go with. You know, what what can we do to continue to advance DEI at this time, right? So I just want to kind of get your perspectives on that. So Veronica, I want to start with you. That's a broad question in our own lives as a community. <laughs> All of the above. No, I mean, you know, whatever perspective speaks to you, right? So if that's personal or if that's, you know, at the institution level. Yeah. Um, I think I would love to see us all be more outcome driven. And I think that's how we can put more emphasis on equity um, and not just diversity and inclusion. I know there's a number of questions from participants around you know, virtue signaling or window dressing. And now that it's been a few years since a lot of organizations um, pretend to start caring about race in 2020, we're starting to see, you know, some of the outcomes of those pledges and the limitations of what amounted to a lot of empty promises and short-lived initiatives. So I think one way we can promote DEI is to actually focus on the equity piece. Um, and that will, of course, begin with taking inventory either at the team level, organization level, um, inequities in the system, and then revising or recreating policies to address those where we find them. Thank you. Melody. I think one of the, the phrases that came to mind is when the President Biden shares sometimes is keep the faith. Uh, you know, I think you know, even as we come across challenges, those challenges won't last forever, you know, and I think the points that we've talked about earlier of continuing to build coalitions, you know, whether that's on your campus, in your community, with government, across different sectors, private sector, government, um, you know, it's all of us coming together that's really going to make a difference in, in moving forward. Um, I encourage you all, I'll share in the, the chat some of the links, so we, I'd love to make sure you're all connected and on our email list, sir. Um, we are constantly trying to share more information, so would love to stay in touch and make sure that we're connecting online. Um, I'd also make the pitch that if you care about some of this equity work, come and join us in government and be part of this work that we're trying to do internally. Um, you know, we are hosting for the first time ever a White House Hispanic Initiative Leadership Program, kicking it off this summer. And so our hope is to, this starting the summer and every semester after, have a cohort of both students and experienced professionals to come and work with us. There are also presidential appointments you all could be applying for, whether they're full-time jobs like what I have, or there are also boards and commissions um, that you could be applying for. And there's also this really interesting authority that I don't think in, enough people really take advantage of, and it's called the Intergovernmental Personnel Act. And this basically is a way if you're working in higher ed institutions, state, local, tribal governments, and that includes K-12 school systems, um, certain nonprofits and federally funded research centers, um, you're able to basically get detailed in or temporarily assigned into work for government. And it happens in a lot of different institutions that folks say, okay, your employer would say, I'll loan you Melody for the summer, um, you know, and the agreement is made and, and run through the process and approved. Um, but I'd love to be able to host, you know, probably many of you or those in your networks through that, those pipelines and processes. 
But I think there's a role for all of us to play and never underestimate you know, the power of your voice, the power of your advocacy, the power of sharing your stories and your experiences. Because I can tell you from where I sit and, and what I see day in, day out, your voices really do make a difference. So thank you for, for all that you're doing to advocate, to share and educate our next generation of leaders. Thank you, Melody. And Jerome. Yes, okay. Uh, all right, so let's see. I'm thinking about three things that are okay. specific takeaways. I love specifics. Veronica said outcomes. Yes. So I'm going to put my hat on as the vice president of the Management Faculty of Color Association. I'll, I'll, I'll throw a link in there for those of you interested. Um, we've really focused on uh, excellence in teaching and innovation in teaching. And I'm thinking about, you know, those of you who are teaching in these conservative states who, you know, sort of feel a bit surve uh, surveilled. There's plenty to do in your courses that make your classes more equitable, um, you know, more inclusive, but, you know, more importantly, more equitable um, without worrying about doing something that's going to draw attention from, from a legislature. Um, let me just give, you know, like a couple examples of what I mean about really making you know, classrooms more equitable about some of the things that I really try to do. Um, one thing that I've really taken to heart is to take steps to move away from traditional grading to some version of contract grading. Um, you know, I used a, a typical labor-based grading format. And this is a realistic and attainable way to move assignments at the least and at the, at the best case scenario to move your entire course uh, to a form of assessment that's not only more effective for learning, um, for all students, but certainly more effective for students that, you know, who've been historically excluded um, from higher education. Uh, so, you know, that's that's one good example that I would encourage people to look up, labor-based grading. Um, and then another easy step is to just really focus on making your classes less steeped in whiteness, particularly those of you teaching in business schools. Um, when I'm teaching business ethics, I just throw all the typical old dead white men philosophers out the window. We don't really, we don't need them to talk about virtue ethics. I've got plenty of awesome material from uh, Native, Native American scholars. And I've got Martin Luther King Jr. if I wanna talk about virtue ethics. You know, so, so I just would encourage you to think more creatively about who your students are reading and gaining knowledge from. Um, those are, those are enough examples of that. Okay, now the last point, I think this is probably when we talk about takeaways for us about how we can really advance DNI. I think the really, the one thing we need to do, I'm, I'm kind of, we haven't talked about this yet. Um, I don't know how we went this far without really talking about, but we we have to really go all in on DNI, uh, DNI as, um, as a moral imperative and to really get away from this business case. I would, I would really ask us to get away from this business case. Um, uh, DNI is important for a lot of reasons, but I mean, at the top of the list, thinking about the U.S. in particular, it's because the foundation of higher education and subsequently wealth in our country is built on um, like the marginalization and exclusion of Black people, uh, Latinx people, uh, Native American people. Our gorgeous campuses that we're all on every single day are built on land stolen from people here long before us, built often by enslaved people or by hyper-exploited people, Black, Latinx, Asian people. And then we have the nerve to deny these students admission to uh, these institutions for decades and now only admit them uh, you know, at, at rates that are incredibly low and embarrassing. That's why I fight for DNI and higher ed, not because um, a more diverse student population makes us all more successful. That's fine, but it's a moral imperative. Uh, it's about reparative justice. For those of you working in industry, not in higher education, um, you know, think about financial services. It's just top of mind for me. We have an entire industry built upon white supremacy, whether it's been the racist lending practices recently during the subprime mortgage crisis, um, the fake racist account uh, scandals at Wells Fargo, or even very, very, very recently, the racist distribution of PPP loans by small and mid-sized banks across this country. That tells us that we fight for DNI in those industries, not because uh, you know a more multicultural organization is a more productive and financially successful work. I don't care about that. It's because it's a moral imperative. It's it's reparative justice. That's why we fight for for DNI. That's why I fight. Let me back that. That's why I fight for DNI. Thank you. You know, I I've heard so much from all of you tonight, and you know, just to kind of sum it up, I'm hearing, whew, 
you know, it has to be outcomes driven. It has to be community oriented. It has to be, you know, about the moral imperative and not just the business case, right? And, and making sure that the work that is done is reparative and restorative to some degree as well, because there's been a lot of damage done. Um, it's about finding every, everyone has a role in this. Everyone has a place and be it in academia, be it in the for-profit, nonprofit sector, be it the government, there is a role for everyone to, to be a part of this. And so, you know, I just want to say that I appreciate all three of you tonight and having this conversation. You know, Jerome, you're absolutely right. There's only so much that we can fit into an hour. We could have definitely gone on for, for a much longer period. But I think it's important that we have these conversations because so many people are feeling overwhelmed by what they're seeing and it's a very reactionary um, response to what's happening versus the long game, right? We have to think about the long game, but also moving with um, efficacy and moving with intentionality as we continue to do this work. Um, I have a, a cousin who's been doing DEI work for over 40 years, so it wasn't called that. And she says, I have a lot of scars. And so we have to be willing to get those scars in doing this work. And so uh, for all three of you, Jerome, Veronica, Melody, thank you so much for being with us tonight and sharing all of these nuggets of wisdom. I hope and I can see from the chat that people are getting um, value out of this conversation. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for being a part of this conversation. Um, and we look forward to continuing these conversations with you outside of this. Have a good evening. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thanks so.